Good morning, everybody. This is my presentation on Arab-Israeli normalization uh, and the gulf between Palestine and the statehood that it, the Palestinians desire so much. Essentially, I'm commenting on the changing geopolitics of the Middle East. Uh, this presentation is for the international webinar hosted by the University of Peshawar, September 15, 2020, this morning uh, at 7 a.m. Uh, so greetings to all of you. And uh, I want to begin by identifying the drivers of geopolitics in the Middle East until now. After the collapse of the Cold War, uh, the main driver essentially used to be during the Cold War, the East-West polarity between the West countries and the communist nations. Uh, the geopolitics of uh, these two super uh, blocks uh, essentially determine uh, the political outcomes to a great extent in the Middle East. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the East-West polarity was replaced by and large by the Israeli-Arab polarity, even though most of the wars between Israel and Arabs were fought during the Cold War. Uh, nevertheless, in the post-Cold War area, one of the driving forces was this desire to create a state for the Palestinians and bring about peace uh, between Arabs and the Israeli state. Uh, primarily because the United States as the sole superpower in the region now entered the region as an honest broker, uh, uh, filling the spaces left behind by USSR. But the United States did not really function uh, as an honest broker. Uh, it protected its own material interests with regards to oil. It tried to continue to prop up regimes that were friendly to it, uh, essentially was an anti-democracy force in the Middle East, supporting dictators and monarchies. And of course, it continued to support what was Israeli expansion, both beyond its uh, borders and within its borders. And there were two other new threats that had emerged uh, in the post-Cold War era, the rise of political Islam, especially the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, and the threat it uh, posed to regimes which are friendly to the United States, and so containing political Islam became one of the United States' major goals in the region, and subsequently, especially after the attacks on the United States by Al-Qaeda on September 11, 2001, uh, combating jihadism became a dominant driver for U.S. foreign policy in the region, and that also compelled many of the Middle Eastern uh, states uh, to align their uh, foreign policies and geopolitics uh, with regards to combating jihadism. However, the Middle East is now changing significantly. Uh, the new geopolitics of the Middle East, which has now led to the normalization of Arab-Israeli relations, uh, is driven by new uh, realities in the region. Uh, I think that the Arab-Israeli uh, polarity uh, has been replaced by the Arab-Ajam polarity in the sense that the Arabs now do not see Israel as an adversary in the region, it's an ally, and hence they are normalizing relations with Israel. But they see the Ajami, the non-Arab states, Iran and Turkey, as the new adversaries to, uh, to the safety, security, integrity of Arab states. So because the new threat is Iran and Turkey and not Israel, you see the beginning of normalization of relations between the Arab nations and uh, Israel. Uh, UAE was the first, followed uh, by Bahrain, and I think uh, Oman will be next, and the uh, rest of the Arab world will follow. Uh, Jordan and uh, Egypt already have diplomatic relations with Israel. One of the reasons why the Arab nations, I think, do not fear Israel is because of two reasons. Number one, Israeli power is now beyond Arab capabilities. Israel is a nuclear power. Uh, it's an, it has a very dynamic economy, has extremely close relations with the United States, uh, and its military capacity probably exceeds uh, the, the military capacity of most of the Arab countries. They may have numbers, but they don't have the fighting ability that the Israelis have. And so the Arabs themselves have realized that uh, competing with Israel militarily is out of the question. But more importantly, I think the Arab nations feel that Israeli expansion beyond its borders has come to an end. Israel perhaps w seeks to expand within the land it controls at the moment by building newer and newer settlements. 
and essentially consoli consolidating its presence in, West, in, in the West Bank. Uh, that is Israel's uh, imperial or co colonial aspirations and not to expand into other Arab countries. And I think this is something that the Arab countries feel and therefore they do not see Israel as a threat to themselves. They do see Israel as a nation that may perhaps never allow the creation of a viable Palestinian state, uh, but we'll talk about that momentarily. But since they do not see Israel as a threat to their own territories and their own political uh, continuity, they are now focused on the threats coming from other Muslim countries like Iran and Turkey. Additionally, the United States is leaving the region, creating a, a power vacuum which I don't think Russia or China are eager to fill at the moment. China will eventually enter the region, but it's, it does not have a significant military presence in the Middle East at the moment. So this power vacuum that is being created by the United States withdrawal, and I will show you um, momentarily uh, the extent of U.S. withdrawal from the region, is allowing regional powers to try and fill the role of uh, the absent hegemon. And so that is why you see an expansion of Iran and Turkey's military uh, in the area. The Arab world is also a failing region. It is full of failed states. Uh, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya, these are states that have failed. Some states are on the verge of collapse. Uh, Egypt is not doing very well at all, and it's a major state in the region. So the Arab world, with full of uh, failed states is becoming a failed region. And so I think its ambitions with regards to foreign policy has become very small and narrow and all they think of is territorial integrity and regime continuity. They want to survive as they exist at the moment. Uh, they do not want to go the way Yemen or, 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 or Libya or Syria are going. They do not want to see collapse, loss of territory, etc. And therefore, uh, rather than threatening Israel or competing with Israel or other countries, uh, Arab states are essentially uh, uh, waking up to the new power reality of the region uh, and normalizing their relations with Israel. They perhaps also see Israel as an ally in balancing the rising power of Turkey and Iran, especially with the U.S. showing less and less interest uh, in the region. If you look at the United States since 2016, it has uh, withdrawn troops from everywhere except Syria and Afghanistan. Uh, and according to this uh, map published by the Eurasia Group, uh, uh, the U.S. has withdrawn 30% of its troops. Uh, and President Trump, who is uh, essentially an isolationist in his approach to foreign policy, uh, really doesn't care about the region much except as a market and source of revenue. Uh, and he is not interested in policing the region or maintaining order. Um, that is quite evident. And so this, this withdrawal of the United States is a, a source of uh, further insecurity for the Arab states. Uh, and they feel that in the absence of the United States, they will have to tend uh, to their own security themselves, uh, especially with the expansionist uh, policies of both Iran and Turkey. And so naturally, they are looking to the only other power there in the region at the moment, which is Israel. Uh, from this map, you can realize that while Russia is in the region, it is essentially interested in Syria, having access to the Mediterranean, uh, and with a little bit of presence uh, uh, in the Shia areas of Iran and Iraq. But uh, Russia is not a major force, and Russia is certainly not going to maintain order in the region uh, across uh, the Arab world. And so I think while Russia is an important player, it does not have uh, the economic uh, capacity to play the role that the United States has for the last few decades in the region. This is an interesting map. Uh, this was recently published by Bloomberg that shows Turkey's expansion in the region. And, and if you are an Arab country, uh, national security advisor, you would be extremely worried by what you're seeing. You know, the, Turkey seems to have military presence in many, many countries now in the Arab world. It has a base in Qatar. It, is, uh, it has military presence in northern Iraq. It has military presence, a huge military presence in northern Syria. It is now involved in Libya, in Cyprus, and it is also projecting power in Africa with uh, potential presence in, in the area of Somalia and Eritrea. 
So in that sense, Turkey is now <laughs> a clearly an emerging imperial power in the Arab world. And uh, I wouldn't uh, be surprised if Arabs are having nightmares in Turkish. The Iranian role is fascinating. It is imperialism by proxy. So if you look at this map uh, of Iran, this was uh, uh, this map was developed by the, the International Strategic Institute uh, uh, that is based in London. This map is interesting, uh, and uh, uh, it was developed by IISS. And what this map shows is that Iran is uh, developing a new form of imperialism by proxies. It has practiced nearly in every major country in the region. Now, of course, uh, we have seen what Hezbollah as an Iranian proxy can do. It's a major fighting force uh, uh, in, in the western parts of the Middle East. And uh, with similar uh, proxies in other parts, uh, Iran is able to project power far beyond its capabilities in the region. And uh, if you are familiar with the fight the Houthis have put up against uh, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and with support from the United States, it shows that uh, Iran is able to project far more power than the capabilities that it has. And this must be extremely troubling, making the, uh, the Arab state very insecure. If you're Saudi Arabia and you're looking at this map, you must be feeling surrounded by Iranian proxies. Uh, in addition to that, uh, what is also clear is that some of these Arab countries, like Saudi Arabia, have large uh, Shia minorities, and they constantly fear that hostilities with Iran could radicalize their own populations. So in that sense, uh, it is quite clear that, that the, the plethora of uh, security threats that Arab states are experiencing now, uh, especially if with uh, the the flexing of muscles by Turkey and Iran is, is, in my opinion, one of the driving forces, primary driving forces uh, for the normalization of relations with Israel. Uh, I expect Oman to be the next, and then eventually Saudi Arabia will also will follow suit. Uh, what will happen then to the Palestinian aspirations to create a state? One thing is very clear, that the Palestinian cause is no more the source of legitimacy uh, for uh, illegitimate regimes in the Arab world. Uh, that's one thing. And number two is there is a fatigue across the region for the Palestinian cause. Uh, and there is the questions being raised as, as to how long will this struggle continue and what does it mean? And what are the realistic uh, aspirations of the Palestinians? Uh, as you can see, uh, a, an independent Palestinian state is next to impossible given the, the territory that Israel has currently occupied and settled. Uh, so it is quite possible that the status of the Palestinians will become a bit more diminished. Uh, they may continue to struggle for an independent state uh, for several decades more, uh, but uh, I'm not very sure whether their cause will be an important cause for several states in the region. Uh, I think most states in the Arab world and in the Muslim world are, are looking for an exit from this uh, Arab-Israeli conflict uh, based on Palestinian aspirations. And uh, once they find a way to talk their way out of it, uh, they will probably rush to normalize relations with Israel and clearly abandon the Palestinian goals. I think it is time for the Palestinians to wake up and uh, make a new assessment of their situation and try to find a path uh, to to a future that uh, is consistent with the political realities of the region at the moment. Uh, and, and I think that is uh, the, the, the future of the Middle East at the moment, uh, a struggle for states to maintain their territorial integrity. Uh, they do not want to collapse to threats from within, especially from threats from political Islamic groups. Uh, and they also are worried about losing territory or even autonomy 
to regional powers like Iran and Turkey. It is a very sad situation as far as the Middle East is concerned. And at the end, uh, I think at the, at the core of, the, of uh, all of Middle East problems is bad governance. And until uh, Arab regimes are able to provide good governance, efficient, effective, inclusive, focused on development, uh, provide freedom to the society to have a vibrant culture, uh, focus on science and technology, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, essentially provide good governance to the material benefits and well-being of their states. I don't think uh, the region is going to come out of uh, the current crisis that it experiences. Thank you.